Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what Welcome, everyone, say. to episode number 62 of a series of episodes that we've been calling Leading Others to Christ. Uh, during these episodes, those of you that have been listening and watching, you know that we're focused on evangelism. And one of our goals is, uh, we say this every time, probably I was thinking about changing the intro to this at some point, but one of our goals is to uh, stir us up, if you will, stir us up in love and good works, especially in the area of reaching our family and our friends and our neighbors with the gospel of Christ. My name is Dan Barker, and I preach uh, for the Creekside Church of Christ in Franklin, Indiana. I also serve there as one of the shepherds. Those of you that don't know, Franklin's about 20 miles south of downtown Indianapolis, Indiana. Those of you that know me, you know that I'm passionate about our topic of evangelism. And I have been ever since I obeyed the gospel when I was 21 years old in Owensboro, Kentucky. And, and really, ever since then, I, anybody that I could hear speak, any article, uh, any presentation, any book on evangelism, uh, I think I've got them all, but uh, I've always tried to uh, to find out, you know, what others are doing and to and to, to use some phrases to teach others how to teach, to sow the seed, uh, to teach others how to be fishers of men, uh, obviously, and women, to make disciples, to persuade men and women, and able to teach others to teach. And I, I've, I'm going to continue to to do this every time. But remember what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, and the things you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, obviously to faithful men and women, who will be able to teach others also. And then later in that chapter, uh, he used this phrase that I really like, is to be useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So when we came up with this idea, what we thought would be good would be identify those Christians, uh, the men and women, those fellow workers who are doing this, uh, who are out there working and reach them and talk, interview them and find out what they're doing, how they're doing it. Uh, and so that's a, a quick backdrop on, on this uh, podcast. So we're really excited today to have someone with us that we're going to learn a lot from. And uh, I want to encourage you, uh, unless you're driving, but get out pen and paper and take some notes. Uh, and uh, as we as we talk to uh, my old friend Gary Henry today, welcome, Gary. Hello, Dan. Good to be with you. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I was trying to think uh, how long ago we first met. Was that that was at Florida College, right? I guess it would have been when you were the basketball coach. Yeah, yep. That would have been. I was there sixty nine to seventy four, so that's kind of given away. Other than our looks which i don't think we've changed much that yeah we're, we're, uh, i'll be 76 this year how old are you, how old are you going to be this year 72 72 okay so you think anybody even wants to listen to two old guys is they're on here talking what do you think <laughs> well i hope so we, you know, i hope we, so too. I, I certainly know a good bit more than i did when i was in college oh, i hope yeah. <laughs> so same same here um well, again, it, it's really great to see you again. It's been a long time. And uh, what we always try to do, to, uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I call it a short bio, if you would. Just kind of bring everybody, because a lot of people know who Gary Henry is. A lot of people don't. Uh, just give us a short bio of where you were born and a little background. Well, I was born in the state of Arkansas uh, in a little town called Hope, Arkansas, which um, has spawned some other individuals uh, out into the world that uh, you may be familiar with. But uh, uh, I grew up in Mississippi. We moved to Mississippi when I was just a small child. And uh, we lived in, in Oxford, Mississippi for a short time. I, I was too young to remember that. Uh, we moved then to Meridian, Mississippi, which is in the central part of the state. And we, we moved down to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi um, in 1962 and that's where we were living when I graduated from high school and went off to went off to college. So born in, in, in Arkansas, but raised in Mississippi and uh, uh, early on planned to preach the gospel. And so when I left college, I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, where I live now uh, to work with the Manslick Road Congregation in a 
uh, training program for younger preachers. Uh, and uh, from there, you know, have, have worked with local congregations in various places in the country. Right now, uh, and for the past several years, uh, I've been doing full-time evangelism, but not working with a local congregation uh, as we typically define that work. I have congregations and individuals who support me uh, to do the Lord's work, uh, but not in a local capacity. I, I worship with the Douglas Hills congregation here in, in Louisville, where I used to be the preacher through most of the 1980s. Uh, but I am, uh, quote, just a member there now. And uh, so I uh, am spending most of my time producing written materials that can help us in the Lord's work. And I'm fortunate to have brethren who are willing to support me to do that. And uh, in addition, I, you know, I come and, and preach the gospel anytime I'm invited to come and, and hold meetings or, or services on special topics or whatever. So I stay very, very busy seven days a week um, doing the Lord's work and that's grateful to be a part of, of the Lord's people and to contribute to what I can do at this point in my life to the Lord's work. I think you know, what we all do together is, is what the Lord brings his work out of and we all don't have to do exactly the same thing, but we need to be involved. All right, well, you know, thank you for that. That's a lot of, and I told you, I try to feed off things that I hear and uh, uh, several things there that you said that I didn't know about Arkansas and Mississippi. And so uh, uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I've got in my notes and I, I, I don't think I've asked this every time to people, but it sounds like a silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Why do you do what you do? Of all the things, when you were a kid, you remember when you were a kid, anybody ever say, Gary, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know? And you said it a second ago that even in high school or somewhere in there, you had the thought that that's what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. you, you remember what motivated that? It's, you know, what, why, why did you think about doing this work early on? I think the bottom line was the importance of the work. I mean, I, it, it just seemed to me, the, you know, in, in comparison to anything else I could do with my time, it was the most important thing to do. I didn't feel confident early on. Um, in terms of public speaking ability, you know, and the other things that we normally think a person needs to be able to do well if he's going to be a gospel preacher. But I felt like I needed to do whatever I could do uh, to help out in the work. And, and when I considered alternatives, um, all of which would have to do with things in this world, you know, helping people in some way in this world, uh, the, the thought always came back to me, well, if you spent your life doing that, and, and if you did it as well as it can be done, all you would have done was to help somebody with the temporary things of this world, and that all comes to an end when a person passes away. But if you're involved in the gospel, you're doing something that transcends this world, and, and you're doing a good that will, that will last way on out into eternity. So just the importance of the work. Yeah, that, that's so good and so true. Uh, you know, you uh, and we, we want to talk about your your writing ability when did you uh when did you realize that you were a writer when did you uh when did that come <laughs> upon you that that you like doing it and somebody somewhere had to say gary you, you've got a talent here so w when did you realize you had this gift of writing that you have well this is embarrassing but it was in the sixth grade um i love embarrassing stories back, so you, you know tell it. Yeah. In the age when you and I were children, uh, when there was when there was somebody of the opposite sex, you know, in school that you liked, that's what we called it back then. You know, I, I liked this person. That meant you were just absolutely head over heels infatuated with that person. Well, you would write notes back and forth. In school, you weren't supposed to do that, but but it got done anyway, you know. And and so you'd write notes, and then you 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 live for getting a note back, you know, from the other person. Well, in the sixth grade, I had a, a fellow student, another girl. She wasn't the girl I liked, but, but she had been apparently in communication with the girl that I'd been writing love notes to. And she said, Gary, you write the best love notes of anybody I have ever read. She said, you are a writer. Yeah. Well, that was an odd way to back into a career as a writer. But in all seriousness, I had teachers at that point who would say, Gary, 
you know, you have a gift with a language. And so as I went on through the rest of my school career, it became obvious that, that though I, I didn't ask for that, I didn't really try to train myself in that kind of way, that that's a way that I could communicate effectively. And so when I began doing the Lord's work, um, Back then, you know, every congregation had bulletins, and so you had to write bulletin articles, and so I got started <laughs> doing that, and then longer articles, you know, for brotherhood journals uh, that were being published back then, and so it was a long time before I ever envisioned doing anything uh, the length of a book in writing, but eventually that came along, uh, began writing uh, the first book um, in this series of books that I'm doing now. I started doing that in 1999. Wow. You know, over 20 years ago. And so since then, that has pretty well preoccupied my life. But Well, you, you are good. <clears throat> and uh, I want to encourage, I know you will, but I want to encourage you to keep, uh, keep doing the work that you are. And, uh, you know, one of the frustrating things that I find, uh, <clears throat> it's not, it's not picking on the area that I'm in. It's just, I think it's just uh, a thing that I've seen. And I, I had a teacher in the fourth grade, uh, you, you made me think of something, that gave me a book to read, and I, I'd never read a book. And, I, and, uh, and he said, read, just read this first chapter. And it was an adventure-type book, you know, and, and uh, he said, just read the first one. And he gave me a time frame of when to have it, you know, and it was easy to do. And, uh, and then he said, then we'll talk about it. I mean, he took that personal interest in me. So we sit down and talked about that first chapter. And then he said, what do you think? Did you like that? And he went, yeah. He said, what, you want to read the second one? I said, sure. So he took me, we ended up reading the whole book. But what it did, it put in me this uh, desire to read. And, and I love to read. Uh, and uh, But I get so discouraged at times with uh, different ones that I talk to. And I'll say, well, did you like school? And they go, no. Did you like to read? No, I've never liked to, you know, and so uh, there's just uh, a percentage of the people out there that uh, that don't like to read, have no desire to read. And that that changes the whole thought process, too, about talking to somebody about this, their soul and reading with them in God's word, knowing that they're not going to read it. Most likely they're not going to read it themselves. So to help them through that process and, and baby step them, if you will, through introduction to reading a, a few chapters here or whatever or or, or material like yours uh, just to try to to try to create that interest uh, and uh, that that turns into uh, a, an interesting thing but uh, anyway that just triggered that thought there but well, you know uh, as as you were saying that it made me think of of our dear beloved Gary Sandusky who passed away not too long ago if there's anybody who would have had trouble reading and studying. It was Gary Sandusky. He was dyslexic as a young person, really graduated from high school without learning how to read. Uh, and, and when he became a Christian, he, he literally had to learn to read in order to study the Bible. But he recognized that that had to be done, that needed to be done. And he paid the price to learn how to read the best that he could because he realized, here's some information that I've got to acquire and it was worth making the effort. And so he, he, he had a bigger hurdle to get over in regard to that than anybody that I know of, but he realized that it was worth doing. Isn't it great uh, experience just uh, when you come, when you get with somebody and you recognize that that's uh, they're struggling with maybe similar type things and where you can use the stories about Gary and, and tell that and let others know that there's others out there before them that had obstacles and hurdles in their way. And they, they figured out how to get around it or get over it. And uh, uh, just to show them that there, you know, there's, there are chances and opportunities to, uh, to go forward. But, you know, uh, you know, you're, uh, we can talk a lot about your books and I, I want to, and I, I call this the conversion story. Uh, and I, I'm sure you've got others, you've got many stories, but is there somebody that comes to mind down through the past that you've studied with or worked with that ended up obeying the gospel that you'd like to share with us? Well, the, a lot of those individuals, and I, I'm sure your experience is the same. We, we never, never cross paths with somebody in exactly the same way. You know, it's often very interesting when we look back and we realize how we, you know, how we crossed paths with 
uh, that person, and that process then resulted in them later obeying the gospel. Uh, you know, when we when we do local preaching work with with a congregation, <clears throat> as as many of us do, there's a certain advantage that goes with that in terms of, of meeting people who need the gospel. There's almost a built-in process there that helps you get contacts of people uh, to study with. And so you're just constantly in the process of studying with, with some. Uh, some are new converts, some are for, obeyed the gospel some time ago. And so you have all of these people that you're teaching. What I have found, you know, since I've not been doing uh, local work, uh, that I've experienced life more as, as most of our fellow Christians experience it, who aren't gospel preachers and who have to make their contacts in other ways. They're not just served up to them on a, a silver platter, like, you know, like for those of us who preach. And so it's been very good for me, very healthy for me uh, to get out and engage the community, talk to non-Christians, you know, show interest in people who are not Christians and get outside of the of the circle of our brothers and sisters that we so much enjoy spending time with uh, to make contacts, but, uh, but it happens in, in all different kinds of ways. Um, I remember a guy years ago uh, that I met on an airplane, you know, flying somewhere to speak and, and you know, how, how it is on airplanes where you're sitting very close to somebody and you, you start talking to them and and he asked, well, what do you do? You know, well, well, immediately when I told him what I did, that generated a religious discussion. He ended up not being a, you know, a person who was religiously interested in any kind of way, was not militantly atheist, I don't think, but he just had never had any interest in, you know, in religious matters. But I gave you my contact information, you know, when we got off the plane and uh, we later uh, connected up uh, corresponding back and forth. And, and though I never saw him again, he ended up obeying the gospel. You know, he, he found, I, I put him in touch with somebody that he could study with where he lived. And uh, uh, it's been many years since I've been in touch with him. But I hope he's still faithful to the Lord. But there was a case where I crossed paths with somebody unexpectedly. Uh, was fortunate to be able to engage him in a conversation that piqued his interest and uh and again, fortunately, it doesn't always tell, work out this way, but fortunately, he was willing to study and to think and, and obey the gospel. So our work, as you well know, and I'm sure you emphasize on this, this program, is sowing the seed. We're not, irresponsible, you know, we're not responsible ourselves for whether they respond favorably to the information, but our work is to try to get the information to as many people as possible. Yeah, yeah. Uh... You know, uh, again, two or three things there, but no, you're exactly right. I mean, we, we talk about this all the time at, at Creekside Congregation to celebrate the sowing of, uh, you know, we, a lot of times there's only a celebration if somebody repents or somebody obeys the gospel. Well, we need to celebrate there too, but to celebrate that sowing, uh, those yeah. people that we have those contacts with, and because that, would, that puts that emphasis on there to realize how important that front end of the process is, if you will. Exactly. Uh, one of the things that came up and, uh, oh, I think it was in our first episode with Benjamin Lee. Uh, he said, he was talking about meeting somebody one time and uh, he said, what if? And I've kind of kept that thing. In fact, I'm going to, it's going to be our theme this year. What if, and, and studying about the providence of God, like you said a second ago, and it's like, okay, well, what if you hadn't got on that plane or that particular yeah. flight? What if you hadn't sat by him, right? What if you, had, you, you know, because you see people all the time, you sit by them and they don't want to talk or they're just, in, but you engaged in the conversation and he, and he wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And then you gave him the contact. What if you hadn't talked to him? What if you hadn't given him the conversation, the contact yeah. information? You know, on, on you go. But uh, let me, can, can I drop something in here? Ye yesterday, I, I had an appointment with my primary care physician. And uh, I, I made up my mind before I left to go to, to his office yesterday. I wanted to try to give him a copy of, of this book, Obeying the Gospel, and also his nurse, whom I always see you know, when I, I go there. And so I did. Uh, when she checked me in, I gave her a copy of the book, and she seemed very excited about it. And then when he came in the room, you know, I, I gave him a copy of it. And uh, uh, 
I've been seeing him for the better part of four years and never had a religious conversation with him. But when he looked at the cover of that book and saw what it was about, he knew, you know, okay, uh, we're going to be talking about religion here for the next couple of minutes. So I found out more in the next five minutes about his background and his presuppositions than I'd ever known about him before. And I'll guarantee you, him having that book, that will transform every conversation I will have with him in the future and and will give me chances to talk about other things. I don't know whether he will ever become a Christian. I, I would love to believe that he would, but even if he doesn't, I have put in his hands a ton of information about the gospel. And if he does nothing but take that book home and put it on the shelf for the time being, that book is going to be a ticking time bomb in his home that he probably will pick up later. And because it's in the format of a little short readings, that it don't take a long time to read any one of them. He'll browse through it. He might see something that piques his interest and he will read that. And who knows where that will go, go in the future. But he's now got the information in his hands that can take him from start to finish in obeying the gospel. Now, I could have left that office yesterday and not given him that book, not had that conversation and said, well, I'll talk to him later. And I may never have. Right. But he's got the information about the gospel now, and that's our job is to celebrate the sowing, as you said. Yeah, well, that that is so good. And uh, But you're right. They will look at you and think when they see you next time, that's going to be the first thing that will pop into their mind probably. Um, yeah. But but good for you that, uh, number one, you have that gift to write, and then number two, okay, write it, but be able to di- figure out ways to distribute it to people. And, and that's an easy one, right, to hand it to somebody. But you had a relationship with them. You knew each other. So it wasn't an awkward thing of like trying to hand it out to somebody maybe on the street or something. But uh, we well, all I have- do. Uh, I, I made it my mind last year that I wanted to give away one copy of this book a week to somebody who's not a Christian. And very often that's people that I've never had any previous contact with and will never see again. Waitresses wow. in restaurants. Um, and I mentioned my doctor, I'm in the process of trying to give a copy to all of my doctors. It will take me a while to get around to all of those people because I have a lot of doctors, uh, but at least one a week. And most weeks is, it's more than that. I mean, people who bring my home delivery from Kroger and, and when I, I give them, give them a copy of this book. I have a little brief sentence or two that I say, and I have never yet had a person, not only who won't, who won't take it, but they all seem appreciative, you know? Yes. And sometimes you know, I've got my contact information in the book, you know, and sometimes they will text me uh, later and say, I appreciate the book. I've read several pages in it, you know? So I, I really give more copies to people that I've never seen before and never will see again simply because I don't want to walk away from those people and then have nothing about the gospel. Right. I might like, I might say that, you know, I I'd rather study with them. And, and if I can do that, I certainly will. But if I, I never have the opportunity to study the Bible with them, at least they've got something. I think it's so good. Uh, and then, but think about this. Uh, I mean, I've had people give me books before, but it's because of the, the culture, the, you know, the work I do and, just like you have, but those people that you were talking about, I mean, who's, how many times have anybody given them a book, a server at a restaurant, a delivery person, uh, yeah. you know, so that gets, that would get their attention. Uh, Matt's already get that. I was looking down on my phone. That's Matt saying, we've got five minutes left. Can you believe it? Uh, but uh, what about this? What about a, a couple of thoughts that come to mind or maybe just one of somebody that, has reached out to you after they've read your book of, of comments that come to mind of, you know what I'm saying? Of, of people that, uh, that you have helped and have reached out to you to thank you. Is there anything that comes to mind like that? I haven't yet. I just started doing this toward, you know, about the middle of last year. And I think at last count, one thing I do, every time I give away a copy of this book, I've got a little, I don't have it with me here, but I've got a little notebook and I write who they are, the date and, and, and where it was. And I pray over every one of those names every night before I go to sleep. And so they're on my mind every day. As of yet, I've not had any of them contact me back. Uh, but I'm living, you know, on the basis of the hope that the Lord will take that information 
and do with it what he pleases, that he will get that information into the hands of, of the people who need it. And it, even if those people you know, give it away to somebody else or take it to the Goodwill store and sell it or whatever, whatever. if we put that information out there, the Lord's going to send it to people who need it. Absolutely. Oh, well, that, that, that's so good. Um, well, we've, uh, I'm going to hold it up. I don't know if anybody, everybody can see it, but let me take my, I got, I have yellow paper all around, but there's, <laughs> there's the book. And, uh, and if you haven't, can you see it? Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Encourage you to uh, get a copy of that and, uh, and share it with somebody, perhaps even like Gary's talking about doing. And um, we, uh, we try, we close this out every time, Gary, with what I call the one thing. And there's not one thing, but um, if somebody's listening to this and they, you know, they're saying different things. Uh, I haven't been involved in evangelism, leading others to Christ. I want to learn how to do this. I, uh, I, I used to do it and I've quit doing it. My fire's gone out. What, what would you say to somebody that's indicating or acting like they want to get involved in, in, the, in the Lord's work? What would be one thing that you say they need to do or learn how to do? Well, I encourage people um, just get out a sheet of paper and, and brainstorm everything they can think of that a person could do in any kind of a way that would be a part of the work of evangelism. And you're looking for something that you can do. I mean, something without any further training that you could, you could start doing today um, and find something that you can do. And, you know, if you brainstorm long enough, you, you're going to find something it may not be the same thing somebody else can do, but that's the beauty of it. All of us can do different things, but, but just write everything on that piece of paper that you can think of that could be done. And a lot of them you say, well, somebody could do that, but I can't. But if you keep writing stuff on that sheet of paper, you're going to come across something that you could do and then do it a certain number of times every week. Set a specific goal for how much of that kind of seed am I going to sow every week? And then every week, hold yourself accountable to that for doing that. And then later, when you find something else you can do, add that to the list. All right. I've said this several times. It's so good, but it is. I mean, I mean, how many people have not done that? Make a list of uh, what, you know, it's like you have the ability to write. Or maybe I have the ability. Uh, I can start a conversation with a total stranger and interact or, or I can. But maybe I can't write, but I can sure hand out a copy of your book. Uh, or I could, like you say, and, and then, but I like what you said about the accountability part. Okay, start doing it, but then, okay, don't just talk about it, but go do it, right? Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah. that and it, and it helps to have somebody else who will do this yeah. with you, and you can ask one another each week, you know, have you done your quota this week? Well, you touched on it, you know, of course, the Bible talks so much about there, the, Jesus sent the 70 out two by two, apostles went out two by two, and yeah. Uh, Gary and I working together can get a lot more done than Dan can by himself for Gary. You know, I mean, and I firmly, I've always taught that is to go and work as a team. And there's a lot of benefit for that. If nothing else, the accountability part, just to keep each other motivated. If I don't have somebody to keep encouraging me, if I don't have a Barnabas around me, you know, I find my, you know, kind of leaning back and saying, Oh, I'm getting too old. I'm too tired yeah. or whatever. But uh, anyway, all right. Well, listen, we're out of time, brother. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to see you again. I'm glad you're doing well. And uh, you got two more books that you're working on, right? Did, did right. I, yeah. I told my doctor yesterday, I said, your job is to keep me going till I can get these other two books written. He said, we'll try our best. <laughs> Walking in Christ and going home. I may have gone home already before. I may have to send that one in from long distance. <laughs> if I've already gone home, then I'll write uh, back and say, it's great. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Please send me that note. I might be there before you. Who knows? Right. But uh, all right. Well, keep uh, keep up your good work. And if somebody wanted to reach out to you, would you would you mind sharing contact information that, that they could reach out to you? Yeah, sure. My, my email address is Gary Henry. It's written as one word. Gary Henry at wordpoints.com. W-O-R-D-P-O-I-N-T-S, wordpoints.com. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. And uh, it really is good to see you again. Uh, 
and uh, keep up the good work. Lord willing, we'll, we'll cross paths here. I, I was telling somebody the other day, probably 80% of the people that we've interviewed, I've never met in person. Uh, <laughs> but I'm glad we have a, a past and uh, uh, I'm proud of you, brother, for all that you've done uh, since I first met you. You've come, you've done so much. So keep up the good work. We'll try to do it. Thanks so much for having me on. Yes, sir. All right. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Melt my heart and fill my life. Give me one soul today.